The Central Club. What's going on, people? Welcome to the Central Club. This episode is brought to you by Reinspire Printing. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the club, and hit the bell button to be notified of future content. Today uh, is a very special day for me, in particular. Um, I'm actually filming, talking to you right now, and it's my anniversary. I am three years clean from addiction. And because of this, I knew I had to talk about addiction today. And today's story is unique, it's raw, it's powerful. It's everything that you expect from the Central Club podcast. So ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Mr. Paul Simmons. Hey, hey, hey. How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? Um, I'm good. Nervous. Uh, I got to say straight away in it, you've had some mega guests on here, some mega guests and, you know, just little old me, man. <laughs> <laughs> little? <laughs> well, no, not so little. Yeah, but you know. No, no. Thank you for coming. It's a real honor. Oh, thank you for having me, honestly. It means a lot. Yeah, I, I th what I want to do at the Central Club is is paint that picture like no guest is too big or too small. Yeah. I try to treat every guest the same and I put the same effort and attention to each guest, yeah. you know, because we've all got a story, as cliche as that sounds, and uh, you're no different. I don't want to kind of give away your story, but I think the best way to start this would be if you could paint a picture to me of where you was, let's say three years ago, four years ago. So um, four years ago, I sat in a jail cell. I was on license for, uh, I was an EPP prisoner, which means I had an extended license for public protection for because I was a ruthless street robber, at, you know, throughout my life. Um, so I was in jail, I was smoking spice, living that kind of jail life, not really worrying about what was going on outside, I didn't really care too tough. I had a missus and stuff out here, I had a missus, but I was still in that jail life, because I was on licence, it was every couple of months I was getting recalled back to jail. It was as simple as that, I would get out and... I wouldn't get on with probation officers and I'd get recalled back to jail. I got a lot of recalls under my belt. So I was in a pretty messed up place. I had my missus kind of going on at me saying, listen, you need to sort it out. You're coming up to 40 years old. It's time to like sort your life out. <sighs> but I don't know if I was, whilst I was in prison, it was like I wasn't really ready to face the facts of, what I needed to do outside. Because in jail, it's like just keeping that, uh, having that face, like you don't care what, what you're missing outside. It's just about maintaining that big I am mentality in jail. As long as I can get a bit of spice to bang up with, I was happy. As long as I got a phone call every now and then, I was happy. But real talk, when it comes come down to it, I was just a bit of a mess at that point in my life. Yeah. And where are you now? Where am I now? Well, um, I run my own community on social media. I go by the name of Paul Addict Mentor. I'm on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, threads, all of, you know, every single social media platform. I'm currently, I'm a finalist for BBC Radio Wiltshire Volunteer of the Year, which is... <laughs> Just nuts. <laughs> Thank you. You've got to it, give a clap for that. We've got to uh, give a clap. Uh, it's pretty nuts. You know, I've been on the news for helping other addicts, um, newspapers, radio. And currently, I am having a documentary made uh, on my life. Just fo someone's following me around, you know, just following my entire journey. So things have really sort of are looking up for me in a real positive way because I decided to stop using. I decided to take my script seriously. I decided that my missus and my kids were far more important than maintaining the big I am stature that I think a lot of prisoners get confused with it and they, they think that's all there is to life. 
I hear a lot of people saying to me all the time, oh, my, my fella or my son, they love gel. That's all they talk about is gel, but that's just, we're just hiding underneath something far more serious because all we're trying to do is get through one day to another day to another day and try not let the world sort of gobble us up because that's what kind of I did for most of my life. I know we're going to go into it, but most of my life was just me surviving until I met the love of my life and she sort of showed me another way. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm so proud of you, man. Honestly, it's it's amazing to see. And you're, you've got 10 years on me. So you've got 10 years more in that addiction as well because you started like a young age. Yeah. And the more you, the more years into it, the harder it is to get out of oh, that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, even down to like you just said then, I'm on this social media. Like, you know, a couple of years ago, you probably didn't even know what the fuck Twitter was. No, so no to idea. do all these things, it's a big deal that people yep. don't realize. No. I think one of the big things that I'm kind of adapting to is growing up. You know, where I've took drugs for so long. It's like I'm still at that age, you know. Yeah. And <clears throat> it must be really hard. For, well, it is for me. So I can imagine, you know, you've had to go through those struggles. So to turn it round, Paul, and to see that you are an advocate for people, an inspiration for people, an inspiration to me. Oh, thank you. You know, because when I watch your videos as well, I feel like, wow. I can do this, yeah. you know, because we, we struggle every day. You know? Every and, and, day. And it can be taken away from us. Yeah, so quickly. So in, in a blink of an eye, everything that you see around you, everything that you've worked hard for, one slip, all of that can go. It's, it's, it's crazy you said, like, everything around you. I've had days where I've thought, you know what? My studio equipment's worth a couple of grand. Like, I get, you know, it, yeah. you know, if I did have that fall, I've got money to fall back on to buy a couple of things. Yeah. Is that bad? It's a natural thing. Everyone has those thoughts, feelings. Some people say, oh, it's a craven. It's a craven. They use that terminology. But I don't, it's not a craven. It's just a natural thought process. If you've been stuck in addiction, like me, 27 years, I was in active addiction. So for me to say I don't have thoughts looking at my... i got a nice little e-scooter at home. i got a bit of jewellery yeah. about me. Do you know what I mean? All these things. If I was to say I've not looked at it and gone... And he morphed into yeah, gear. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm a liar. You'd be lying yeah. because that's the addict in you. The addict doesn't leave you. You just control the addict. Yeah. It's always within us. You know, I was a poly user, which means I used everything. Do you know what I mean? When, like I said, we got to talk about the spice thing in jails because we when that hit, wow. Wow, 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 wow. We sure will. And I think this podcast is going to be really interesting because we had a conversation beforehand, which I really want to like let people know as well because I actually had an inbox the other day off someone from Ireland who said, congratulations, I'm a big fan. We would like you to come over and sit at the top of the chair or something like that, he yeah. said. And, and I, I, I didn't know what he meant, but he just thought automatically that I'd done 12 steps. Oh, yes. Oh, so what I, said, I said, I've never done 12 steps, but I can still come. And he went, well, no, you can't. You yeah. can't step at the chair. And I thought, wow, even in addiction, even in recovery, there is stigma, stigma and you can't do this, you can't do that. And we were talking about how me and you haven't done 12 steps no. and we're very strong minded on that sector. Yeah. It, you know, there's, your way is the right way. There's no, there's not just one way no. of coming through this. Your own recovery. Like I run something called the non-active approach. Yeah, I've got a few rules that I stick to that keeps me clean, sober, non-active in my addictions. But if you're a 12-stepper or someone over there is just recovering on their own, that doesn't mean my way's right. doesn't mean your way's right or his way's right. It's just recovery. doesn't matter how you get there. It's just about getting there. It's just about people going, do you know what? I used to use drugs. I used to have a behavioral uh, addiction because, we're, you know, addiction is across the board. Like we were talking about earlier, you can have an addiction to the smell of people's trainers yeah. if that's your addiction. 
but you've still got to yeah. deal if with If you're it. gonna burgle houses to nick people's shoes, it's a problem. Yeah, it's Good. a problem. You know, and it's not you know, we say it's a cross board as well, but it's everything that goes with it, it's the lifestyle with it as well. Yeah. And I think that's probably when we talk about the twenty seven years I've done this. Yeah. It's that pattern of behaviour of what you're doing. You're on autopilot sometimes and the autopilot's a really, really good explanation of what it is. Um, I'll run you through a standard of mine. This is what I used to do. I'll go gel, get caught, get myself clean in gel, right? So I'm feeling kind of healthy now. I'm all right. Oh, my discharge day comes, right? Discharge day, clean, sober, living my best life. I walk out of the gel, I go down to the nearest front line, wherever, what town, city, it doesn't matter where I am, and I'm going to score. And that's what I would do consistently over and over and over yeah. again. And no, there was no one telling me, Paul, oh, you need to stop, mate. Yeah. This, is, this, is getting a bit, this is getting a bit crazy. I just had it through all my teens, all the way through my 20s and all the way through my 30s, I had that opinion of this is how you do gel. This is how you get out. You yeah. celebrate. It was. A it's not celebrating. You know, I'm getting released to have a new life. It's that's my smoke today. Yeah, that's, that's my smoke. That's yeah. my smoke today, man. And there will be people getting out of jail today, doing exactly that. And I used to have so many conversations towards the end of my my prison career, and when I'd have conversations with people. And they'd be telling me, oh, I can't wait to get out. Honestly, I'm just going to get a big... And I'm like, mate, <laughs> haven't you learned anything in all of the years you've been coming yeah. to prison? The first thing you want to do when you get out, go get something to eat. Go see your missus. Go see your kids. Go see your family. But most addicts, they don't do that. They just get out of jail and go score. And then you're straight back on that yeah. treadmill of having to go out grafting. I think that's environment as well, though, isn't it? Because when we get arrested, we're, we're actively using. Yeah. So when we get back out to that environment, we know that's what we were doing before yeah. we came in. Um, because when you're in that day before, that day before release and you've got those butterflies, you probably, oh, we, you know, your eyes are set on that, that, yeah. that, 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 that smoke. But... You know, a week before that, you was just content in life as being yeah. clean. And, you know, you did cherish the little things like eating with a proper fork. And yeah. I can't wait to just have a normal meal and yeah, yeah. touch my missus. But when it gets to that day, you know, we, we, we know there's prisons, like you said, people getting out. We know that there's shotters who hang around prison yeah, oh yeah. in those city prisons, you know, those yeah, dispersals. Yeah. We know there's people hanging outside those jails waiting to sell stuff. We yeah, wait, waiting to spend your discharge grant, man. Yeah. They want that money. They don't care. They literally don't care. And when I used to get out of jail, I'd get out of Bristol prison, go straight into town, and I'd have the same old shotters offering me bits. Yeah, we ain't seen you for a while. Yeah, have this. Old that. Old that. Hold that, yeah. yeah That's the language that. they yeah, use. Yeah, yeah, Old that. And, you know, because they know in 20 minutes... It's gone. It's gone, and you're out grafting because you want some more. And then they've got you in that, that trap. And it is, it is a constant cycle unless you are willing to change your ways, adopt um, a more sensible thought process, you're just going to be continually in it, continually in it. And, you know, almost 30 years, almost 30 years, I spent active, actively using, get clean in jail, get clean yeah we class that as yeah clean. yeah yeah get clean uh gel clean and get out and it was just crazy and my crimes went from pretty you know stealing car stereos stuff like that early doors a little bit of shoplifting when my addiction started to grow and it grew at a rapid rate of knots i just turned into like a real ruthless ruthless criminal yeah. it was real bad um you know we have to be very careful because i do have like victims of crime and stuff and stuff like that so you know um but some of the things that i did some of the offenses that i committed like kidnap robbery false imprisonment those were things that now when i look at it i'm like how was i doing that stuff and i, I look at my kids now like and i'm like I was going out rather than 
spending time with my bloody kids. And that's something, you know, you've got to learn to live with. You've got to adjust to that and accept that's what we were. So all I try to do now is go, right, I'm going to maintain my life this way. I'm honest, I'm open, mm. I've changed things about my life. And I'm just trying my to do the best I can and bring as many people as I can with me. Because as you know, like the 12-step thing, it can be very secular, you know, they've got their own community. And I'm trying to create an inclusive community yeah. where it is literally any form of addiction, you're welcome. Any point in in your um, recovery, you're welcome. Whether you're religious, non-religious, whether you're spiritual, it yeah. shouldn't really matter. You can be a 12-stepper. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely be a 12-stepper. And, you know, you're welcome. I wish it was the other way around. Yeah. You know, I wish we were welcome because... I do feel left out with some of the stuff. Like, I read and I think, wow, that yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah. But you can't take it or leave it with it. No, no. You have to be all in or not at all. Now, I put on my social media recently, a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, I'm getting quite fed up, you know. I'm doing all of this stuff. I'm getting all of this media attention. But when it comes to being invited to events, you know, I don't get any invites. So a friend of mine was like, right, I've had enough. You're always putting these people down. I've got a mate who's quite high up in 12 steps. I'm going to get him to get you in. That guy inboxed me back. He didn't do it over online. He inboxed me back saying, I've got to apologize, Paul. I spoke to, to my mate high up in 12 steps and he said, because you don't work the steps, you're, you can't come. That is yeah. so sad. Yeah, it's it's just, I personally, I don't understand it. I don't see why if you don't do that kind of recovery, you're not welcome into a well, community. You're, look, you're probably looking in the wrong places, isn't you? Yeah. You're probably just looking at them them 12 steps things. But yeah. no, that is really sad. That mm. is sad, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's just another form of, of, of being casted out like we was a, as addicts, yeah. you know, being judged. Yeah, being judged because you don't believe in a higher power. Well, you don't live a type of way. live a type of way, yeah, and that's it. Look, we'll we'll dive into all this. Yep. We need to go back, and I, you've just you just ruined it because I was going to say, what is that accent <laughs> for the people? Yeah, true Bristolian, man. You know, for all your Welsh boys, yeah, I'm in Wales today. Yeah, snuck in, you, snuck in. Well, it's easy to sneak in over that bridge now because there's no pay toll. <laughs> no pay toll. Bloody hell. Well, no, you, you are, you are, you are our 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 closest yeah. neighbour. Yeah. You know, and it, it's it's a stone throw away. Bristol, a city that is to me fantastic. One of the one of the best cities in the UK. Uh, very diverse. Agreed. Uh, very multicultural. Very anarchist. Yeah, yeah. You got I think Bristol gets overlooked. Quite a lot in in everything. Yeah. Um, what was it like growing up there, Paul? Um, so uh, I was I lived in Bristol through the eighties and most of the nineties. So um, I grew up in a really weird situation. Do you know what I mean? Um, my mother is white, my stepdad's white, and my siblings were white. You know, so I always felt kind of left, left out. out sort of and then the area i lived in uh Hawfield, lotley's by the prison, prison yeah. uh was the same kind of area so i always felt like i was trying to prove my worth all the time all the time trying to prove you know be one of the boys lots of my mates used to say to me this is <laughs> yeah you're black but you're not really a black are you you're like one of us do you know what I mean? So I had that, I've always had that sort of uh, thrown, thrown around me because I was always in a, a, a white area. The white man in a black man's body. Yeah, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah. All of that stuff I'd get thrown at me. Uh, yeah, so family life wasn't easy. My old man was a bit abusive, you know. Um, I got taken out of my family home when I was quite young. How but, old? Um... I have to be sure. I think I was nine. You know, okay. I like I keep saying it's nine or ten. It was at eighty-eight or eighty-nine. I was I was taken out of my family home, so I was put into the childcare system, 
And unfortunately, it wasn't great at that point. There was lots of abuse going on. The school I went to was full of just bad people. You know, lots of blokes who should know better. You know what I mean? They were there. Teachers? Teachers, yeah, teachers. Care staff, they used to call them care staff. I always find that really funny. Um, because, they didn't care. No, they really didn't care. It was kind of, the school was kind of wild. It had a reputation for kids to go there and just uh, cause chaos. Uh, yeah, so I was there in, up until I was 16. Left school with a few GCSEs, but really messed up. Like, really messed up. So yeah, like this, like I would like to go in a bit about yeah. your childhood because this plays a massive factor yeah, in yeah, everyone's yeah. life. Looking back, if like, was your childhood like something that you was there any fond memories in your childhood? Yeah, man, there were, that, and that's the problem. Like I talk about being abused as a kid and stuff, but I did have good times. Like my dad would take me to football. Like I'm a big Bristol Rovers fan. I got that from him. So it was a real confusing sort of time in my life, really, because at one point I'm like, I've got memories of it being curled up in a ball when a guy's kicking 10 bells out of me. But at the same time, I've got him passing me a ticket to go to the football midweek. You know, I mean, very confusing time. Yeah. What was the reason you went into care? Did, did they just didn't want to bother with you anymore? Or was I think, you really... I, I think I was hard work. And they didn't know how to. They didn't know how to cope with me properly. Didn't know how to like take care of me. Like, do you know what I mean? I was. I. I was hard work, and I know it because one of my sons. I see the traits, you know, but I'm taking care of him in a way where he knows how to deal with those traits rather than taking yeah, a beating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's what it kind of was with me. It was more about. If we can't control him, we're just going to beat him into submission. Mm. And it does, that didn't work. Just turned me into quite a violent person. Can you explain or paint a bit of a picture of, of, of what it's like for a child to go into care? It's nuts. It's nuts because all of a sudden, you uh, I was living at home. It wasn't great, okay? But I was living at home. I had brothers, sisters, mum, dad, the norm. Then all of a sudden... I had social workers coming into the house, taking me away, plotting me in a children's, like a care home. For I was there for about two months, and then they found a permanent school placement for me where I was boarding. I used to board there, do you know what I mean? And it's a lot to take in when you're still in single, single digit age, like, do you know what I mean? It's really weird. And to top it off, I never used to get visits. They never, no one never used to come see me, and that's where like the bad behaviour comes in, really, with uh, staff. Because I think when they see that you're not someone who's got mum and dad coming to see or overwatching, yeah, you know, none of that. I didn't have any of that. Do you know what I mean? I was, it was just I was there to to do what I was supposed to do, and my mum and dad were kind of like, "Well, we're getting on with our life. You get on with yours." It's very bizarre, really bizarre. Do you have a relationship with them at all now? Um, unfortunately, my dad passed last year, um, so we didn't really get to any sort of uh, resolution there. Um, and my mother, no, I've cut people out of my life to save protection. Yeah, to protect myself and. Since I've done that, I'm flourishing. I'm, I'm, you know, getting on with life. So sometimes it's best just to to keep to stay on your own and not getting, don't, not letting other people sort of get. Is in she your way. in like a reachable distance? Like, yes, you know yeah, 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 yeah. My mum's like literally. My mum lives about forty minutes away from me. She doesn't live far away from me and stuff. We've had a few conversations and stuff. She really doesn't like. The fact that I'm so open and honest about stuff. You know what people are like. They don't like their uh, laundry being aired. No, of course. But it's something that I'm comfortable with. I'm not going to hide from who I was. I think people have a right to know that behind the criminality, there was 
there was not oh, reasoning. Like, yeah, there was. was reasoning. Not, not blame. No, That's not blame it. No. But, yeah, I yeah. know. And and the care system, uh, you know, did you feel helpless? Yeah, that's exactly what it's like. When you got big ass men like twisting you up as a kid when you're in a school environment, that's hard to sort of quantify in your brain. It's really hard. Still to this day, I, I envisage the things that happen and I'm like, there was just no one. There was no one I could reach out to. There was no one I could complain to. Because whoever I complained to, it, it was all within a, a network. So I was, it was never going anywhere. So I just learned to shut up and get on with it. Anyone during that time, do any of these people, these individuals stand out in your memory? Or Yeah, you know, there are, you know, there are lots of people like, bad stuff happened to me. Like, you know, without, without going into it and causing traumas for everyone, you know, I was abused in every single way you can imagine for years. And so when I got out of that environment, I just tried to leave it like that. No one's ever faced any charges. I've never gone to a police station and moaned, you know what I mean, and tried to get these people sort of facing justice. That's not what I'm about. I'm about saying this is what happened, deal with it, and we move on. And that's the way I've been. What does child abuse do? Oh, sorry, Rich, two secs. It's gone. It's mm. gone. Okay. One of the... Uh... It might be on that edge, uh, yeah. It's loose, uh, I said. There you go, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 cool. Sweet. Okay, ready? I'm going to... What does child abuse do to a human being? It literally, um, it destroys you from the inside out, mate. Uh, when you have people older than you, more powerful than you, taking advantage of you, it just, I turn into sort of a sort of a wild animal really i can't explain it in other any other way than that i just had so much hate within me i just it was this big ball of hate that i just i was angry at the world and everyone in it literally i just wanted to cause chaos and harm i wanted everyone to feel what i'd been feeling without telling anyone what I was feeling. No, you know, I didn't open up and go, do you know what, this happened to me. This is why I'm in and out of the courts every two minutes. And I never did that. I just was just an angry person for, and no one actually had any understanding or rhyme yeah. or reason of why I was the way I was. Until I started talking about it, until I started opening up, it was only then that people went, oh, oh, that, that makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah, no, I understand. Was there anything you was good at as a child? Anything you wanted? What did you want to be? Was was there something you wanted to be? Um, when I was, you know, when I left school, I had ideas of getting some computer kind of courses or doing something like that. You know, I uh, I went to try to do college for a little bit. That didn't work at all because I put myself on the streets and stuff. So there was. I never really had any aspirations to do anything in life, and that's that, that's quite bad. Up until like a few years ago, when I decided to start putting myself out in in the public eye, I, I was just. Do you do you think that a lot of that is just because you're focusing on survival? Maybe at that time, it's yeah, it is it is survival, and that's exactly what it was. Just trying to survive. Um, not letting anyone in, you know, within me, I didn't, yeah. you know, it was all about just making sure that I wasn't getting hurt anymore. I wasn't going without anymore. And because of that, it just turned into a crazy town. So you left the care home? Yep. What happened next? So I, my idea, my plan was to go home. 
Um, I went home for about three nights, something like that. And I could just feel that the abuse was there. It was there. It was there. It was coming. So I did a stupid thing. It's a stupid thing. But I, I was living in Wiltshire at the time. My parents had moved back to Wiltshire. So I jumped on a train, went to Bristol, just jogged on. 16, could do what I want. So I went to Bristol um, and just hooked up with the the homeless brigade. At that time in Bristol, we're talking late 90s, there was a huge homeless community in Bristol, absolutely massive, you know, and unfortunately within that was addiction and lots of addiction and getting involved in, I was getting involved in petty crime, small things still, just trying to make a buck. But I would find myself going out in shoplifting and begging, selling big issues. I did all of that, just trying to make a few quid. And when that wasn't enough, you know, my addiction grew. And as my addiction grew, my need for cash grew. So going out doing a bit of shoplifting, it just wasn't doing it for me. It wasn't doing it. So I started street robbing. You know, get, I had an imitation firearm, thought I was John Wayne, going out, like, committing uh, committing crimes with an imitation firearm to start with. Then I got a reboard firearm, thought I was from Menace to Society. And then, like, do you know what I mean? I got a real gun. No, no, no one's going to mess with me. And just home invasion robberies. How old was you when you got this gun? 17. 17, coming on 18. I got my first firearm, you know... Was there many firearms in Bristol at the time then? Um, there were. There were. You know, there was a big gang culture around at that time. There was a big gang in Bristol called the Aggie Crew, yeah. right? Yeah. King Aggie. King Aggie, yeah, Clinton. And so there was a lot of that going around. And it was, I never had it for today, in today's money, right? If you walk around with a gun, the, the likelihood is you're going to use it. You walk around with a knife, the likelihood you're going to use yeah. it. I used it as a tool to frighten people to get money to fund my drug habit. Mm. And I have to say that my whole thing was instilling fear into people. It's not big, it's not clever, it's not something that sits comfortable with me today. But that's what it was. It yeah, was instilling yeah, yeah. that fear into people to get what I yeah, needed. Do as much as you can without hurting them, you know, if it came to that, though. Yeah. Yeah, if it came to it, then yeah, you know, I've had to, I've pistol whipped a couple of yeah. people, like, do you know what I mean? And I did my time for it, I've got to be honest. I wasn't the best criminal. I'm not, <laughs> you know, I I got like, um, I started getting a couple of year uh, sentences. That couple of years went to like a decade, got out from that, and obviously got another yeah. nine and a half. So it was like, I was getting big sentences. Most of my. Um, adult life has been spent sat in a jail cell around like that jail mentality. Mm. So to get to where I am today from there, it's just huge. Yeah. You talk about you was adopted by a white family, siblings white, area white. You're white, yep. so they say. Yeah. So going to Bristol, did you feel drawn any to, to, to places like St. Paul's? Eastern, did you want to try and blend in with the culture? That's exactly where I went, dude. That's exactly where I went. I went straight to St. Paul's, straight round Eastern. All of them spots. Stay because, put and road. Yeah, and... stay put and road. You know how it is, man. And I just wanted to feel part of something. I didn't. I felt even more out to the, to the sides because all the black people that I knew at that time, they weren't smoking drugs. Yeah, they you, were selling drugs. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I was a guy who was like, I was completely opposite. I was like, mate, give it me. That's from the white culture, that yeah, is. Yeah, it's from the white culture. <laughs> and everyone's like scratching their head going, what's going on with this Why is guy? this brother blazing? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it was, I, I can ima- Yeah, I can you, see you, that. You I know understand what, that. You, know, you can imagine what they used to call me when I used to go frontline. And you know, I'm trying to score a two, t- what two brandy you? and whiskey. Do you know what I mean? Can you say anything? Oh, not really. It's no. not. It's not. 
you know, but it was, you know, it's a lot of junky scum sort of behavior like towards me and I'm a sellout. It, it's, like, a it's like, it's like, it's uh, like when someone's, uh, if so, you know, when a black man's gay. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, that, that shame. Yeah. You shouldn't be gay or, you know, when they find, you know, they find out you eat pussy. You yeah. Know, back, <laughs> you're a bull cat. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah, imagine, yeah, I can yeah. imagine what it was like for you, mate. Honestly. Yeah, it was pretty nuts. Let and, me tell you, when I was in jail, and in jail, a lot of the medics are Africans, right? There are a lot of African people who give out the meds and stuff. Oh. When I used to go for my methadone, I used to get some of the dirtiest <laughs> looks <laughs> from these women because they're looking at me like, why you should be at home with your kids and your missus? What are you taking this for? Why are you in? I'm like, oh, drop me out, innit? Just drop me out. I don't, I don't need any of this today. Let's talk, yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. It gets pretty nuts. And how did that make you feel that, you know, you've come somewhere to try, you know, whether it was intentional or not, you yeah. was hoping for some sort of belonging to yeah. then be told, fuck off. Yeah, yeah, no. It was pretty mess messed up. And it made me just dive down, like really down low and stuff. Like my addiction knew no sort of, there was no low that I couldn't go to in my addiction, do you know what I mean? I'm talking, I put myself at so much risk because I just felt I had no one. I didn't have anyone. I had no support network. I had no one I could phone if life had got to that point where, you know, most people would get to that desperation point and they got someone they could phone and go, listen, I am messed up. A granny, uh, yeah. a granddad. Uh, someone. Uh, uh, someone, yeah. I don't know grandparents. I don't know aunties and uncles. I don't know, because I, I didn't have that relationship with my family. So I didn't have that. So I just went completely down to down, crazy yeah. town. Yeah. I'm from Cardiff. Cardiff is a city which has, you know, uh, a reputation in Wales. Yeah. Of, it's got the best drugs. If you're from the valleys, you go to Cardiff. Yeah. 10, 15, 20 years ago, Bristol. if you was from Cardiff, you was going to Bristol. Yeah, and the Valley Boys would go straight to Bristol. Yeah, man. What was, paint a bit of a picture there of those drugs and, and the quality and what, what was so it like? So back in the 90s, it was strong, strong, strong. And I know people will go, oh, you're going rose tint glasses and all of that rubbish. But, <laughs> but the crack was crack cocaine. That's what you were smoking. Heroin was heroin. Do you know what I mean? That's what you were getting. To, um, you had going down St Paul's front line it was complete it was wild you had all of these brothers outside the black and white calf, black and white calf yeah. just there putting your their hands in your pocket to try give you like take the money in one hand and give you the items in the other. it was a war over who was selling to who there was the police wouldn't come down to St Paul's they would not come in St Paul's all the way through the 90s it was lawless and you had a big homeless community the the mad thing is that the night shelter in bristol is in st paul's that's mad it's in st paul's Can on paint, front line yeah paint a bit of a picture there because normal homeless shelters would be in a city center yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's not <laughs> it's uh, yeah it's You'd not be fuming if you was yeah. a local like who didn't yeah. you know yeah it's it like I said, um, it's so in a housing estate or a community. Yeah, it is in a. It's in the middle of a housing estate, just off. It's like there's a small. Um, is it off the main road? Just off, it? just literally, just off the main drag. You know, if you're going from town through St Paul's yeah. all the way down through, it's just off to the right. You wouldn't know it's a night shelter until the night time when you see all everyone yeah. queuing up out there so it's and like having a, a secret smoke what would you call it it's not even in the suburbs is it it's you know yeah it's right it's it's, it's literally in a, in a housing estate right in cities like it's just off city center because st paul's is just outside of the city center and then you've got like i said you have the black and white calf you have the blues you have the the taxi rank all the way up through there it was all stinking of ganja all the time you had the seed center where everyone used to go get their soul food yeah and then you just have like all these homeless people just busting about trying to like 
trying to get a, a, a bed for the night. And I sp stayed in many a night shelter. One of the things I'll never hide from the fact I was a proper homeless guy. I went sofa surfing. I didn't have, you know, spots that I could go to. When I when I had nowhere to sleep, I had nowhere to sleep, man. I slept outside for months and months and months and, at a time. And would you stay uh, in St. Paul's or would this be in the city centre? City centre, yeah. Because, yeah, you know. Yeah. You can imagine people living on ter like sleeping on terrace houses in a yeah. fucking area, yeah. like it's been mad. No, you get you get your ass, you get your hand, ass handed to you. Can you? Uh, so what were some of the like um, spots? Schoolboy errors. Give me some schoolboy errors when you first became homeless. Things that you fucked up on. Yeah, fucked up on. Lost my trainers more than one occasion. Taking my trainers off at night to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, genuine well, manners. Yeah, manners, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? You take your trainers off, put it by the side of my, my, my sleeping bag, wherever I was, whatever car park I was in. Oh. Wake up in the morning, I got no trainers. Like, do you know what I mean? Having to bus through town 6 a.m., nothing on your feet. Go into the Salvation Army to see if they got anything to fit on your feet. Like, <sighs> That's a schoolboy error. Another one is giving people my money to go and score. <sighs> just we're just too trusted. Too sometimes. trusting, and unfortunately, because that's the nature of addiction, isn't it? You know, there's always someone trying to get an easy score. Yeah, always someone wants to get an easy score. So you know, you'd all put your money together. You put the trust in one guy he, to go he ain't off, coming back. and he ain't coming back, and he's got enough to last in the whole day now. So yeah, that's that's one of the things I used to do a lot, and being embarrassed. I used to be quite embarrassed to go to um, like the Salvation Army for things to eat, um, food banks. Before, like today, yeah, yeah, no, everyone goes to a food bank. It's just natural. Back in the day, the only food banks were for the homeless people. Yeah. Like little places where nurse, uh, nuns in Bristol, it was yeah, going little, to the nuns, yeah, yeah, and they'd give you your food hamper or something nice. Yeah, yeah. But early doors, I was too proud. So you'd bite your nose? Yeah, yeah, literally. I'd bite rather go face. robbing. All right, why, are you going to a, why are you going to a food thing for? Yeah. Just go rob. What's wrong with you? And that was my mentality. Yeah. What was the biggest shock back then? Like, you know, what was the thing that you thought, fucking hell, this is, this is, this is the real world now. What am I going to do? It's just, you know, having to walk around all night. And that's one of the things where you're too scared to sleep because I was very young. You got to think, I was very young. I was a teenager. So I'd be walking around. Sometimes I would walk around, not just Bristol, anywhere. Just keep walking. Do you know what I mean? Just make sure you stay up on your feet. I'd stop at a park bench or something, get a little, and then, whoa, no. And I'd be up again. So I was, that was kind of me for wow. for quite a long time. And I'd, <laughs> when you're living on the streets and you've got a big heroin addiction, you've got a big crack addiction, and you've got no one to to call friend, no one to call support, it's real lonely. It's scary. Do you know what I mean? There's more than one occasion I wished that, you know, just walk out in front of a bus or something. You know, that that's the sort of things that I had in my head because, like I said, and I have to keep saying this, I had no one. I literally had no one to fall back on. And I'd go jail, get out of jail, no support. Do you know what I mean? It was like... yeah. I'm sure you've heard this a million times. People go to prison and they come out and they're homeless. Straight night one. Night one. I remember one time I come out of jail, night one, sleeping underneath a hedge. Well, yeah, you see it. Like, there's been so many times where, like, I'll see people and I'm, like, buzzing. You're going home. Yeah. And the face of, the, the, the look of worry, distress, just they know that they're going out to the streets. Yeah, yeah. They're better off inside better off inside and and to say that in 2023 uh now all right in the 90s it might have happened well it, it's still happening yeah, now still this happening is something now, that's yeah. fucking unbelievable i know certain prisons i'm not gonna name and shame them right because that's not what i'm about name and shame them. <laughs> <laughs> i know there's certain prisons in the north of england that if you're getting out with no fixed abode they're giving you a tent and asking you to find somewhere to go pitch up out of the way. Wow. That's 
the support you are getting once you've done your prison sentence, once you've served... Rehabilitated. Yeah, once you've now rehabilitated yourself in the eyes of the law, they're really just to throw you out on the streets, make you homeless again. So you're straight already, you're already back on the wheel because you're getting out of jail, day one, got nowhere to go. So then you're thinking, I'll be better off back in jail because last night I had a bed. Yesterday, I had a plate and bowl and a spoon and knife and fork, and I was going to the hot plate. Today, I got to go out and graft if I want some money. I got to go out and rob someone or burgle something or whatever it is. And that is the genuine cycle yeah. of prison. And also, I don't want to sit on the streets, no, you know, um, wired, you know, no. totally sober. So I know I will just dive myself into oblivion, commit crimes, yep. enjoy my smoke until yep. they then lock me up to where I want to go. Yeah, exactly that, mate. So sad. So fucking sad. But addiction and addicts are 90% of the prison, right? 90% yeah, of the Yeah, it's all drug-related, yeah, isn't it? It's all drug-related. Whether you are a dealer or a user, right? Or but a it's domestic or, or whatever. Yeah. Something's been used with drugs. Yeah, with drugs, right? So it's a big issue. And the problem with prison, you've got one recovery program. Oh, and it's shit. And it's terrible. <laughs> it does not work. When you force someone in prison to go on a recovery program, the only reason they are doing that is to, to get, get out, out early. early. Yeah, to get out early, to get a decap to get, you know, parole, whatever it is. It's not about it's not about you going, right, I want to do this because now I'm ready. Mm. You can't force someone into recovery. No. You had to choose. I had to choose. And it's that point in life where you go, right, that's it. But at the moment, you've got the wrapped course or the 12 step pro. It's all the same, right? Yeah. It's all it's all it's all the same sort of program. But once you've done that, then what do you do? Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because... Why do you think it's only those projects? Is it because they would say it's proven maybe and they yep. get funding to go in to do it? Or yep. Like if me and you said, now, right, listen, because... I genuinely believe people need to look at how, how we've got clean yeah. and, and we need to like model that. Yeah, absolutely. If Imagine if me and you went to Cardiff Prison or Oldfield now and said, look, we've been clean, clean. for this long. We don't think that 12 steps, well, it didn't work for us. That's not how yeah. we done it. This is how we identified it worked. Yeah. Can we go and speak to some inmates? Because we know we can relate yeah. to them. They know they would look at our life and think, fucking hell, I could do that. But they would say no fucking way to us, wouldn't they? They yeah. would say like no way. Like they're scared of education via experience. They a lot like the system is scared of lived that. experience is yeah. the way forward. I will say Wales is is doing well at the moment, and we're, we're getting there. And it's a shame that England they need to follow up they on that, really but it's do. still not where it needs to be in Wales. You know, yeah. it's. So it is a million miles away. But you're right, it is. It's just like there's only that one course, isn't yeah. it? And it's like, that's the way. Yeah. And that's, that is it. They are going, the prison system at the moment is going, this is the only way to recover. If you don't do this, even though you might not be using and you're doing great in jail, if you've not done that course, you've <laughs> not showed that you're trying to recover. Yeah. You've <laughs> not shown that you're trying to be clean. And then everyone's like, hold up a minute. Yeah. I've been clean for two years. I'll have, you know, doing it my way. But that's no... That's, it's Before this time now, like, was, you know when, like, people say, how long, what's the longest you've been clean? Yeah. Would you just weigh up your prison time? Weigh up my prison time, man. <laughs> because we've never been yeah. clean out. No, 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 yeah, yeah. Longest time I've been clean was, like, almost eight years. That's yeah? amazing. Yeah, yeah. Cause I was in I jail. Was, I was in jail. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Real clean time... Four years. It's that environment. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. It's, it's, I can pick up a phone and I can score a heroin if I want to. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the difference. And that's the true difference about whether you're clean out here in the community. And I'm not taking away anyone's clean time in jail. I was about to say that. Yeah, I feel because, a bit bad now. Yeah. No. We're because not I take... remember how proud I was when I was clean. Yeah. Jail. Yeah. It's great knowing that you're not using. Because don't think you can't go in jail. 
and go a few cells down. Yeah, just there. And get something. Yeah, the heroin is not so much in the prison system anymore. Yeah. But an addict doesn't care. They'll just change it. What what drug is available? What can I get hold of? Oh, you got you got, oh yeah, I'll have yeah. that. That'll do, mate. Pre gabbling, yeah, I'll have that. That'll hold me. Yeah, that'll hold me. Just something, and uh, that's the thing. And once you choose not to do that, you should be bigging yourself up and going right. Yeah, this when is you the go, start of my go to bed time. on a on a on a you know on, on a straight day. Yeah, on a straightener, man. You're like, yeah, yeah, today was a good day. I know people, though, who are like literally anti-drug. They're drug dealers. And they will come to me on a wing and say, yo, listen, can you get me any of those sleepers? Can oh. you get me any of those sleepers? They're the biggest fiends. Yeah. You know, fiends. I want the catiapine. Yeah, the Give me those catiapines. Mate. I'll so give you my baguette for my catiapine. I, like, I was on <laughs> 400 mil of catiapine every day. Yeah, so I used to get Shop a, them up, 100 in the morning, 300 in the evening. And if you didn't think I had a line coming out of my cell door on an evening time, once I'd got my 300 mil catiapine, you're smoking some <laughs> more. Because, and it was all the same boys. All the same, you know, the yeah, big like the boys. Yeah, the boys, right, the yeah. boys. <laughs> yeah, all of them. And I'm like... Mate, you really don't these are want antipsychotics. This. Yeah, these these, <laughs> these stop me from wanting to rob you, right? <laughs> you don't want to be taking my meds off me, yeah. honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I never looked at it like that before because that's what it yeah. was. Like, um, they give a lot of people in jail catiapine or or meds like that. Go, metazapine, metazapine, one, yeah, metazapine, and it does calm a lot of the jail down. But like you, like you've already alluded to, there's a huge, huge business in jail for medication. Mm. Like people think the only drugs in jail are the drugs like the prison officers. I mean, are getting thrown over the wall. Prison officers Fucking don't bring drugs in. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mate, I've heard some stories. I've seen some fun stuff, man. So have I. I seen a I seen a prison officer dropping off a can of monster to someone once. I just thought that's the most random thing. He just walked past my cell. I was on the phone. It was like quite late. He's just kind of monster. He's walking around and I've seen him walk back and he didn't have the can anymore. I thought, you've just gone and give someone an energy drink. It's such a small thing. But I was just like, if you, that's the start, mate. I don't think you realise, but that's the start of something because, you know, that's prison, isn't it? You get in a prison officer one way and before you If he you brings know a it, monster drinking, he's bringing in... Yeah, he's bringing in... Like he's being yeah. in an angst next week, yeah, and that's when you say, Look, it, it don't matter if it's a monster drink or that, you'll get the same you're time. You're getting a sack, mate, you're getting a sack either way, unless you're bringing it in for me, isn't it? Because now I got yeah. you, and yeah, that happens. A lot. I've seen um, uh, recently in Berwyn, the new city oh, jail yeah. in Wales, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but about the prison system. But it's like, I just wanted the secret before it goes out my head where. They had to recruit and a load of new staff. Have you noticed how many got caught shagging inmates yeah. and bring? Because they're just they're not experienced. Yeah. They're uh, fucking they get manipulated them. Yeah. so yeah. simply by these experienced hard and prisoners. You are dealing with prisoners who've been in and out of the system they for twenty the odd years, right? They know it. And then you've got this ex Tesco's worker, yes. st shelf stacker, coming in, seeing the guy big, muscly, sweaty, walking around with their towels. Some of them women, they go, oh, they don't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> they really don't. And yeah. you do hear it all the time at the moment, uh, prison officers in a relationship. That's because half of the prison officers are now a female. And they're all under like 21 years old. They never used to be like that, did they? <sighs> no. No, no, all big men, scary fucking men, all like caps down, just so, just so you can just see their eyes. You knew, you knew you were in jail then. Like the system now isn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it isn't. Do you need a work uniform? Want to start a clothing brand? Or maybe you have a football kit that needs a logo printed. Well, if I was you, I'd get in touch with the Reinspire Printing Company, down to Forest Industrial Estate for the finest printing and embroidery in Wales. I use them for my custom-made mankini, but you could use them for t-shirts, hats, hoodies, and many, many other things. So, what I would like to kind of do, really, is is, is talk about your prison, your yeah. prison experiences. Mm. First, first time in, how did that come about, and how old was you? So, I was fifteen. Uh, coming on sixteen, I'd had several probation orders. You know, when judges see you as a kid. They'd love to give you a probation, a bit of community service. I had about four <laughs> running, like 
back to back, yeah, side yeah. by you side. You get your nine lives, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you get your nine lives. And I've gone to court one day, Trowbridge Magistrates yeah. Court, this was. I remember it like it just there. The cells were like old country and western bars. <laughs> so, I mean, you could all chat and pass stuff through the bars. And I've gone up. And it's the same judge who literally like two weeks before had said, you're on your last warning, last probation, da, 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 make sure you attend. Didn't attend, obviously. And they were like two months, Portland, right? And didn't know, I didn't know, no, weren't aware of any prisons. Weren't really, you know what I mean? I didn't know much about anything. I've gone to Portland back in that, that time as well. The police used to just you're back in the back of a police van. They take you to prison. It wasn't like no it is wagon. now. No meat wagons like it is now. You know, Reliance or Circo, Circo, whatever it is. It was in the back of a police car. And I remember it's all the way down in Weymouth from Wiltshire. The whole man. way there, this copper is going. You do not want to be going to this jail. You are oh. not ready. This is one of the worst prisons in the country. All of that I'm hearing. And by the time I got there, I'm a nervous wreck, mate. You know, I'm a big kid, right? I was six fours, you know, quite large, but I'd never been in jail before. I'm a, I remember walking into Portland, man, and I've gone, yes, boss, to one of the screws. What did you call me? You call me, sir. I work for a living. That was my very first experience of talking to a prison officer. Him, and I was like, oh, this isn't great. I remember <laughs> giving me like a, a bag of clothes, Y fronts, blue, like all your blues. And you, uh, back then it was shirt, tie, jean, shoes. Do you know what I mean? I had to, you had to have shave every day. Even though half of us weren't shaving back then because we were so young. Do you know what I mean? You had a shave today, Simmons. No, no, sir. Get no, back to your cell. To. <laughs> I don't need, what do you mean? Have I, I don't need to shave yet, mate. <laughs> oh, all right. But that's why most of us have got beards now, because we were all that's shaving all the time. <laughs> it was military style, wasn't it, it was, back then? It was military style. Like It was all things, bed packs and shock, um, slop outs. There was no toilets, no electricity in the cells. Definitely no Xboxes and Playstations and TVs. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was real military. You used to have to make a bed pack, which was sheet blanket, sheet blanket in a sort of square box style. It was very regimented. Yeah. You used to, used to have to march towards going to the work, in going twos. to the gym, yeah, into twos. Um, anyone dropped anything? Anyone dropped any kit? The whole lot of us be down doing press ups and sit ups and all. It's very structured. Yeah. Very yeah, structured. No, I. I've, it's a weird one, Portland. I'm always fascinated with it because I used to visit there mm. 90s, in the 90s um, yeah. for my uncle who was about your age. And um, yeah, he was down the block a lot down there as well. Yeah. And he said it was pretty bad. But e hall was real bad. Yeah. Mm. And apparently like, you know, it was bad. It was a rough jail, but it was mainly rough because of the, the officers. Yeah, the officers made it rough. Now, it's not like it is today. Now you go to jail, there's people getting slashed up, stabbed up pretty much daily, unfortunately, in most most yeah. prisons. Um, back then, it was fear of the prison officers. It's they ran the prisons. Now, prisoners run the prisons. You know, it's like, and people go, nah, that's not true, mate. But it is true. And what, and, and what form of rehabilitation is better then, would you say? The, the original. Resident. The original. Take it, it needs to be taken all the way back to ex-army officers showing you how to actually live. Well, don't you think that's interesting in this day and age where we talk about, you know, being a bigot, misogyny, um, being woke, woke, you know, fair yeah. pay, equal pay. Can you imagine if we said, listen, women, you're not allowed to work in prisons. Can you imagine yeah. the uproar? Yeah, yeah, it'd be crazy. Well, and sorry, this is just another excuse, uh, yeah. another reason, sorry, why we are failing as a, as yeah. a society then, really, isn't yeah. it? Because you're someone at first hand who has lived on both sides of the penny. You yeah. was there in the 90s when it was military style. No females, probably one or two. Yeah. And now you're, you're now looking at these 21-year-olds who are fucking inmates yeah. every left, right, and centre, bringing yeah. in drugs. Bringing in drugs, phones, uh, everything. And we're too scared to make that change, are yeah. we? They are too. It, it's, that is the problem. They are too scared to make the change. Um, we've given people too much choice. 
right? And that's the thing. When you are giving a society all the choice, we start adopting the wrong choice. And at the moment, the prison system has gone down a, an alleyway yeah. that I can't see it coming out of. That all of the courses are gone. When I first went to jail, you could be a plasterer, you could be a bricklayer, you could be a painter and decorator. Now you can be a wing cleaner and yeah. work in the kitchens yeah. or pick up litter. And then it's education. And then education. Or make some music yeah. and yeah. play Fruity Loops. Yeah. Which is good, but it's, it's not like no. trades. No, you need a trade because how can they say they're rehabilitating people when basically they're holding people in, in a cell for 23 hours a day? Yeah. I did lockdown through COVID, I had no spleen. So I was on the uh, critically, extremely vulnerable list, right? I was wow. getting letters from um, Matt Hancock saying, you need to stay in your cell. You need to shield. So I went from Cheeky doing- bastard. I went from doing quite hard gel, what I thought was to doing almost impossible gel. I was locked up all day, every day for a year. One whole year. I did banger. It was blocked yeah, with what the was TV. That like? I just missed lockdown, see. It was, it's, it made me not want to go back to jail. You know, that was part of the, part of the reasoning for me to be where I am today. But it was so bad for my mental health. I've, I was a self-harmer and I'd not done it for years. And through that lockdown, I had serious Triggered thoughts. It sear daily thoughts of self-harm i'm lucky i keep a diary so all of those thoughts that i had are written written down i've recently been going through my prison diaries wow. and stuff I'm, I'm lucky i could read and write from an early age i'm lucky i can keep a diary in prison but as you know there's a lot of the prison system they've got zero education can't read can't write big men Big men making a whole heap of money outside, but when it comes to writing a letter to their kids, they can't do it. That's very sad, isn't it? Mm. And you see relationships build from that, though. It's quite yeah. crazy. You know, you get the one person who's probably very intelligent. Yeah. The other one's a big man. Yeah. You know, but you're reading his letters. Reading for him his and, letters. Yeah, yeah man. it's crazy. Yeah, isn't yeah. It? I never went without a vape, mate. I'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Standard. Yeah. You've got to make it somehow, haven't you? Yeah, you have. Yeah. Something you said on a podcast before, which I really resonated with, and I, um, I've heard off my uncle, someone who's really got a reputation in the yeah. city, was in there and was a different person. You said, it, you could be a road man, you could be the big I am out here, but when you're in there, and it's true, there's people on the road who I don't look at as nothing, no. but in there they are a fucking animal. Yeah, animal. And why is that, do you think? Do you think um, it's not having anything to lose? It's and literally not having anything to lose. Some guys look at their sentence and everyone goes, oh, they're doing, you're doing only half of your sentence. Some guys don't go in there looking at half. Some guys go in there going, right, I've got five years. So that's me. The worst case scenario is I've got to serve five years. And because of that, they do go in there and they don't care. They will write off prisoners. They will write off prison officers. They will write off governors. They literally don't care. The, you can go from a street guy out here to a big man in jail, but it can go the other way as well. You can be a big man out here yeah. with all of the trimmings of life. And you go in there, someone looks at you and don't like you. That doesn't mean none of that stuff. The outside trappings mean jack. do not mean anything. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I did a podcast with a football hooligan and he was saying the same thing on that. You get someone who can have a, a scrap. He's, he's yeah. got a reputation, but he goes on the football and he, he just shits his pants. Yeah, It's weird, but I think it is that. That is a big part of it. Like, something to lose. When you're in there and you think you get caught with a phone, I can't get caught with a phone. Yeah. I ain't having extra days. My missus no. thinks I'm out on this date. I got yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah. I got work. I got to get, you know, and someone who ain't working and fucking is a nobody on the yeah. road. You don't give a fuck about no. striping someone up because, yeah. well, a couple of extra months. Oh, well, great. Dude, you know? Like, people pay in prison, you can pay to get anything done. Uh, you know, do you know what I mean? Someone's upset you, there's someone else on the wing. 
that'll go turn that guy over for you for a bit of spice paper or a bit of money in their canteen, a few packs of vapes, whatever it is. There's always that in prison. So no one's ever safe. I, I've always said that being in jail is constantly like you just eyes on you, innit? Constantly from the moment that door opens until the moment you're back in the safety of your own cell, it's it's chaos. What type of person was you? Was you a type of person who had to be up at half seven when that door opens, or was you someone who just didn't give a fuck when nah, the door opened? I was up, I and I still wake up at around six a.m. I still to this day wake up early as hell because. I was always that guy, man. I couldn't sleep with my door unlocked. I could, I had to be up just in case. Because you can upset someone in jail without even knowing no. you've done anything wrong. Literally. And they can go back to their cell. And stew, eat them alive. stew yeah. all night. They're like that in the morning. He's fucking, I've yeah. seen the way he's, he's coming for me. That's oh, what they think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what they, know, they'll, yeah. they'll they'll convince themselves that you're coming for them. So you're all sat in your bed having a good dream about the missus. Next thing you know, you have got some animal coming in your cell, shanked up, wanting to put holes in you, and you ain't done nothing. <laughs> you know that happens. You know, you know, prison that happens a lot, a lot, a lot. It's the prison paranoia. That's what we call it. Prison paranoia. Where anything can be a uh, um, activator to to create chaos and carnage. Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, pad mate of mine uh, from Newport, good boy, won't say his name. The guy I was talking about here mm. the other day, uh, earlier, sorry, who was bringing in constantly, yep. he was bringing an ounce in, every ounce of each, ounce of crack, ounce of heroin on a visit. He was the only one who was getting, yep. but he wasn't bucking to no one. So people obviously get angry. Yeah, get angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My pad mate was up at five in the morning, vexed, press ups, sit ups. He's having it. He's having it. Yeah. We got opened. He didn't get opened because the screws knew he had. They stuff. knew. Yeah, yeah, they knew. They knew. But he might not never know. Yeah. That boy was down there locked up because he's the. He might not never know that he was there, ready yeah, to kill him. Ready, yeah. He was ready. Press ups, you're having it, and he would never, even none, none the wiser. None the wiser, man. He's like, what? What's going on here? And that's the thing in jail. You can go in there with drugs, right? You can go in there, the big man, and you can get your visits and stuff like that. But if you don't break people off, yeah, people get angry. Yeah, and guess what? You can't break everyone off in jail. You ain't got enough for that. Oh. So you're always going to end up upsetting someone. Yeah. So my advice will always be, <laughs> don't get involved in it. People yeah. ask me all the time on my live streams. They're like, Paul, what's the best advice you can give someone going to jail? Don't beg. Don't borrow. Don't steal from no one. Just keep yourself to yourself. Yeah. Mind your own business. Concentrate on your release date. Try to get a bit of education behind you and just be quiet. Yeah. It is what you make it, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, I, I, I learned very early on when I went to Birmingham and like I was having a visit mm. and everyone around me was like, were you having a visit? Like it, when you, when you realise that even having a visit with a family member yeah. could open you up yeah. to people bringing you in a cell after your visit and, and, and tripping squat, you. Squat, squat man. Yeah. Squat, no. And you're like, what the fuck? I, I've, I've been, just, I, just I, been seeing my grandma. She's yeah, about no, to die. Well, you don't think grandmothers don't bring in yeah. drugs? What, my gran used to bring me in drugs for them? Didn't, didn't she? Didn't she, Dave? And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. Squat, man. Mate. It's squat. fucking different world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I've, like... The amount of times I was in Bullingdon and someone had asked me to use my cell, I had the top cell in the corner, on the falls, right in the corner, out of the way. So the amount of people that used to get taken to my cell, do you know what I mean? And I'd walk back in there, just be like shitty bit of cling film on my side. And you're like, well, I know what's happened, what's just happened there, like, do you know what I mean? Like getting little sorters and stuff. But it was, you know, it's a dangerous... Dangerous situation. Getting people getting spooned and all that. Yeah, getting spooned. Now, that's a rape charge. It's, it's a yeah. rape charge. And people need to be aware of that if they're going to jail. If you decide to mess with someone's backside, <laughs> it's sexual assault. But guess what? It happens a lot. 
a lot. I've had it put on me before. Someone thought I had a phone when I was in jail, and they tried putting it on me. It was only because I had a few boys around me who seen me getting kind of taken off into a not a not such a good reputation of a cell that people come and like, no, 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 he's all right, bruv, he's all right, let him out, do you know what I mean? It's that situation, and I'm someone who's known in the system, like, lots of people have done bird with me, might not have chatted to everyone, but a lot they of people, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean, I was a face known in the, in the system, unfortunately, because I did so much time in there. What's the worst thing you've seen in prison? Uh, the time when I seen that guy getting opened up, man. Seeing someone get opened up like a tin of beans, like from their neck to their bum, is one of the worst things. I have flashbacks of that still, you know, and this was over 15 years ago, I'd say. And it's a flashback. It's just, it's really upsetting to see. So the, the amount of violence that can be handed out uh, from one person to another, and not just... Not just prisoner on prisoner, prison officer on prisoner as well. I've seen some real unacceptable behaviour. You know, you've seen the George Floyd knee on the neck. I've seen that almost every day in <laughs> yeah. my jail career. Yeah. You get them vulnerable prisoners who yeah. kind of act out as well, and they're yeah. the ones who get it the worst. They get it the worst, man. Like, the bigger you are, genuinely, the less the screws give you drama. Like, I hardly ever got drama in jail from the prison officers. You know, I got twisted up when I refused transfers and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? You go in. You go in when they say you go in, and that's the end of it. Uh, But some of the behaviours, man. Some of the behaviours. So Some of the the, uh, vulnerable prisoners. Like, the ones who are having mental health breakdowns clearly need medical help yeah but the screws will just go in there shields on you know helmets yeah. on and just well i've I, i've been in and i've been like rattling and yeah you know i've had things wrong with me and you ring that bell and like it's meant to be a like you know sometimes you ask him for something silly and he goes, it's yeah. emergency only yeah but rest assured like i know it, it's got to have happened people have died yeah because screws haven't come to that door in time. I'm telling yeah. you, they just don't. They they just don't give a fuck. They and you'll go there asking, I got, I, you know, I got something wrong with me. Give, give you a palace Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're just like, you're like, mate, I've, I've been, I've been crapping blood for the last two days. Yeah, yeah no, just have a plaster. Wait, you're all right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait in this. There's no dent. Dent. This is the worst. And oh, you got toothache man. in jail. Yeah, yeah. If it, do you know like well, people know that pain, that real toothache pain in jail. You just got to ride with that. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to ride with it when you're almost banging your head off the side of the you door. You want to take that where, apart, Yeah, where you're trying to... Lo- I've put the plastic fork in a tooth trying to get rid of some of the dead stuff where I was in that much pain in jail. But you just... There, there's no um, empathy. No empathy for many prisoners. You know, a judge said to me, I, I have lack of empathy. But where he put me, I realised I was pretty empathetic. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Uh, No, no, you're quite nice. Up to some, because some of the behaviour, it's animalistic, isn't it? It is. And I think, you know, we go to prison and that's our... That's our... Punishment. We don't go to jail to get punished. No. No, 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 no. It's it's, it's wrong. Um, What made you think, what stopped you from changing each time you came out? Because like you said, you know, when you're in there, you want to change. What do you think it was? I wasn't open and honest about all the stuff that had gone on in my life. And this is the thing, unless you are ready to open up and be genuinely honest about what's going on, if you're suffering from mental health issues, if you've been abused, whatever it is, if you're not dealing with it, all you're trying to do is hide from it. And that's where my issues would be because I'm I'm not dealing with it, but I don't want to think about it either. Let's get obliterated. Yeah. Mm. So you could identify then the things you was hiding. Yeah. What would you say to someone who probably don't know what they like? Kind, you know, there's people out there who don't even know. They've got no ideas, man. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're running from something. They don't know what they're running yeah. from. It's a really difficult situation. Like this, I'd always say to someone, man, like when you're starting to open up and you're starting to deal with things, just work with honesty and openness that is that is 
it's what's got me to where I am today, being honest and open. Yes, I was a junkie. Yes, I was a robber. Yes, I carried knives and guns and all of that crap. But at the same time, I was a messed up kid. I went from home to children's home to like a reform type of school. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was all pretty messed up. And not at any at that point was I asked, you know, what is it? Why are you acting out? There was never any of that. It was only literally when I opened up for the first time to my partner. My partner's the first person I ever really? told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Never told anyone until my partner. And when I was away on my last sentence, she was like, you need to start talking to someone. You need to open up. And once I started speaking to the mental health team in jail, a proper one, not like, you know, you get the, some jails, you get the mental health team and they don't really care. No. They think you just need your script raised rather than mental oh, health. Cause, yeah, you know right. that one. He's just moaning about his drugs. Really. Yeah. He just wants a buzz. Yeah, he just yeah. wants a buzz. Right. So once once I started talking to them, it was like a, like I'd lifted a weight off of my shoulders, man. It was like, oh, this is, that wasn't too bad. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't too bad talking about you know certain stuff that went on and as long as you've got a good rapport with the people you're working with you're always gonna come out right you know you, you gotta have trust and that's a big thing to have in jail trust in yeah. prison staff you know they these people mental health teams in jail they're not technically you know they're not prison officers you know but it's still quite hard. Sometimes. They still got a key. Yeah, they still got a key. When they can come in, lock you up, and unlock it's you. It's worrying, isn't it? Eh? It is worrying because you're like, how do I know they're not going back and yeah. discussing it with the governor and telling them my deep dark secrets? But you've got to go through that prison train, and if you've got a key, so yeah, <laughs> you feel like they've got yeah, they're the same side, isn't it? Yeah, you do feel that. Yeah, I I was definitely. I held off for so long having trust in anything to do with the prison system because all I was aware of was you twist me up, you come in my cell, you twist, like, wreck my cell searching for shit. Why am I going to trust any of you lot with what's going on in my life? But like I said, it was the missus. The missus was like, mate, you need to sort your life out. you got a lovely place. Like By the time I was ready to get right, I had a flat, two kids, a missus. As you know, a lot of guys in jail ain't got that. No. They ain't got that. No. Do you know what I mean? I had a flat to come out to after all of those years of getting out of jail, homeless. You know, I had real, no real excuse to continue to use apart from I would have wanted to. And I've been trying to quit using drugs most, yeah, yeah. most of my life. I wanted to be free of it. I just never, you know, never really put that real effort in, never really decided to talk to anyone. And once I did, like I said, it was just like this weight was lifted off me. And I'm four years, two months, almost four years, three months clean and sober now. So that's a massive, massive yeah. from, from a guy who was like a few weeks, a few weeks here, a few weeks there, and then I'd be straight back on it. Now, like I said, I'm I'm in a situation now where none of my friends like, <laughs> the, who like the nose candy, they won't come anywhere near me now, because like, 'cause they're like, Oh, he's oh he's a drug mentor now. He helps people That's with crazy, addiction. He it? helps people with addiction. We can't no, 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 we can't go around his house anymore. So it's I've gone like full circle and being the guy, you know, people know he didn't care, he was just a bit of a mess. So the guy now, the people are like, we cannot have drugs around him. He will put it on our toes so quickly. And I will. I will because you know, as I know, you have to keep your space clean, tidy. You can't let any people within that. Well, you, well, we spoke about the documentary I've been making with the BBC3 yeah. and you was like, what? You was around? Yeah, I, I can't can, believe that, mate. I, yeah. I, I, so just for the people, I went somewhere um, where there was two people using crack. And I said to you, if they brought the foil out and started booting, yeah, it'd probably been game over. So that's kind of why I was kind of kept equipped with it. The crack was a demon of mine, but it wasn't the demon. No, um, I just, 
I seen the bottle, I seen it, but when they did smoke and blow it, I walked out. Yeah. I couldn't be around that. No. Because that smell would have turned me. And it turns people sketchy. You don't want to be around sketchy, sketchy people. people. No. no. I couldn't imagine being around, because like, this person you see now isn't the person. If I was to sit and have a pipe now, I just... Twitching. Ch- twitching. I'm, I'm the worst, yeah. Doors, windows. Kni- knives cupboard. Yeah. Knives, knives draw. draw. All of that, <laughs> mate. I used to sit smoking crack and have a big knife there. Like, you know, put my crack on the side and just, like, tempt people. Go oh, on, I dare you. Dare you put your hand near my stuff. Do you know what I'm just, like, nuts. Pure nuts behaviour. Like, putting toilet roll, toilet tissue in the keyhole of my yeah. door. Like, real, like, twitchy behaviour. No one ever, like said anything to me i guess they were just too scared to but now i look back and go man you were nuts man. after doing a graft well you know whatever you yeah. to make it when you have a pipe that's the worst because you just think people look at i genuinely yeah. believe i can see shadows yeah in the shadows room. people coming for me i can see them yeah and yeah that you know yeah. we're like Everyone you've done wrong, I'm meeting in the community centre. Yeah. Come and rush you now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're the worst yeah. ones, mate. It's, uh, that's, uh, but that's the problem is when you live in that, in that lifestyle, that's the, that's the thought processes because you're always, always doing something wrong. Yeah. You're always wrong in someone. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, and I, I said it about my uncle. He, he, he wronged someone, a, a bit, you know, some heavy people yeah. for a large amount of, of, you could say, drugs or money. Yeah. And when he was smoking the bag, he was there. You know those old like um, the, the pick what are they called the big ones like the pick yeah, 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 yeah. He had one of them, and he was just. He, he, it took him a couple of weeks to smoke the whole thing. Yeah, right. But he did not enjoy any single bit of it. No, 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 because no. he was just at the door the whole time, waiting. And I thought, you're not. You know, there's a price. There's a price yeah. to be paid to take this. You didn't get it for free. No, you know you've done this, and and, and that's like what, what what fun is that? I say to people, I realised I had to stop when I was smoking crack, and the first pipe would make me feel absolutely terrible, and every preceding pipe would make me feel worse yes. and worse. I stopped getting a good buzz from it years ago, years and years, but I would still take yeah, it yeah i knew exactly the feeling that was coming but the madness of addiction said it's going to be different this time yeah this time it's going to be all right and it would never was it never was <laughs> it's just bad because you want it back to what we was that first yeah. time in it yeah yeah we haven't really spoken about the character you was, the kind of madman yeah. you was. Maybe we will, because it's going up to yeah. the spice epidemic. Um, the weapons man. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, yeah, you was labelled the weapons man <laughs> on another podcast. <laughs> what? Why? Oh, dude. I used to make I used to make tools and stuff for people in jail. And in jail, there's any way to make money, any way to get your daily graft, get your spice, get your gear, get whatever it is. And my thing was just making shanks for people. It's not nothing. It got made a bigger deal out of it. We all know what we're talking about. <laughs> the weapons, about. man. Yeah, I'm not getting into it. No, it but, is. It yeah. is like labeling. Like, yeah, but yeah, it, no, no, I get you. Yeah. You know, like, like, yeah, like when I worked, when I was in Stoke East, people used to, because I was in the cooking course, people yeah. used to ask me to bring lard back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because people wanted to scold people. Like, yeah. I, you know, I didn't even realise at the time until I seen the one guy going, Gwen, nice one, la. <laughs> and I realised what it just done. <laughs> and the guy's like, and I'm like, oh shit, but it's, you. whatever you are, whatever you're working in the jail, you pick up a graft, didn't Yeah, it? half to graft. So what, what, how would you make your, how would you make your shanks? Um, so you'd either do the old toothbrush, melt the end of the toothbrush and put two razor blades straight into the, the bristle ends, melt them straight in. And I used to put a bit of uh, green sheet around them to keep make sure they were in there nice yeah. and tight. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Really. So you could, you could, yeah, you it's could, not, they're not falling out. No, not they're not in. falling out. And that's a problem, do you know what I mean? Used to, if they used to go in a month. Yeah, because you have the two. The two. Like Can you explain why the, for the people? So if you cut someone with two razors, if you cut someone with two razors, you are literally open them up like that. It, it comes 
real bad. Uh, it's quite graphic, right? And people are, people might go, how can you be making tools for people if they're going to do that? If I didn't, someone else would have gone. They would have just gone to two cells down and gone, do you want to make that for, for tenner or 20 quid? I'm like, yeah, of course, not a problem. Do you want to hold this in our... Do you know what I mean? And that's the thing in jail. It's all about the graft. I used to make hooch. I was a mad hooch maker. I got I made hooch so much, the governors would stop taking my canteen off me because they knew if they took the canteen off me, I would make hooch. So I'd got canteen. So in the end, the governor said, Mr. Simmons, we're not going to do this. I want you to have some canteen just so you'll stop making hooch. Because... Yeah, Gel, that's one of the worst drugs in gel. Alcohol. Uh, alcohol, because it just turns people into You was banned lunatics. from the oranges, was you? Banned from the oranges, mate, yeah. <laughs> well, they sent me to Dartmoor in the end, and you can't buy orange juice or sugar on the canteen really? in Dartmoor prison, yeah. That went out many years ago, like many years, because it just got so mad. Yeah. They're like, right, we're just not going to sell it to you. So for the people as well, like just to say on the, the two the two blades, just because they're very hard to stitch together, yeah. in they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Messes your face up. Can like leave you with a really big, fat, horrible scar on your face. So was there times that you made these blades for people, these shanks, and and they you know for a fact they were used in yeah. action? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Several, several, more, 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 more than a few times. I tried. I try not to overthink that stuff. I know. Sorry, man. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> sorry. But you know what? It's like when you're in the madness, you don't really think about it. And like in the cold light of day, you're like, "Wow, you know, someone's just yeah. got really messed up." But that's unfortunate. Yeah. That's the prison routine. That that's kind of everyday occurrence in there. Yeah. So we've spoken about like the kind of evolution of prison with the uh, staff and stuff. One thing that's really been a big evolution is the drugs culture in there. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say the, the class, there's no class in, in the drug use anymore. You no. Know, you, if you had a bit of heroin in jail or a bit of crap, you know. Yeah. Spice. Spice. It's Spice I've, paper. Spice. Yeah. Well, when it was rice first yeah. and it was just, you know, it was the plantation. Like, yeah. you know, that was bad enough, you know, but... You're saying, you know, you've got the rice paper now. Like, it, that's the maddest thing. Like, imagine having the old school staff now with the spice. I reckon they would put it in all the more because there'd yeah. be no fucking around. No. But it's like there's worse of drugs for the more weaker staff to yeah. deal with. How did you uh, come across spice and do you remember taking it the first time? Yeah, first time I come across spice, I was in Loudon Grange, Cat B prison up north. Never heard of it before. It was being sold to everyone at that point as a synthetic cannabinoid. So it was a way of getting Weed. stoned, <laughs> but without the drug test, because early doors, there was a no drug test for spice whatsoever. Yeah. So people were just smoking it, rago, getting high as hell, going to do the drug test, coming back negative. Yeah. Um, and I remember the first time someone sold it to me as, no, I just thought it was strong weed, didn't it? Do you know what I mean? But they were like, make sure you only have like two or three puffs at a time. I'm like, well, I've been smoking weed for years, mate. What are you on about? So I've just gone back to myself. Laced it. Laced it. Smoked a few puffs. Next thing I know, I woke up. I was on my floor. Vomit everywhere where I must have just projectile vomited out. Because it's, like it's like a poison, yeah? Your body reacts to it. It tries to get rid of it, and that's where the vomiting comes from. When you go man down, properly man down, uh, it, that's what happens. You go into like, it's, it's very much similar to um, ketamine, a K-hole. Where they say yeah. you go into a you hole, lock. yeah, you you lock off, you go into somewhere, and you're just lost until it releases you again. And I just remember waking up thinking, "Rah, what the hell?" But looking for the other half of the the spliff that I'd rolled because I'd not <laughs> not smoked it all. So I'm like, "Well, that was good, wasn't it?" Puff, puff. Had a couple of more hits, knocked myself out. Woke up in the morning like. And that was my very first experience of smoking spice in jail. So I was smoking it in jail, smoking it in jail. 
But when I got out, it's it was legal. So I was buying it in the shops. I was going buying it in the shops. But I wasn't I wasn't classing myself as a spice head or anything like that. I was just someone who was smoking fucking spice. Do you know what I mean? Until it got to a point where I was getting in debt in jail for it. I was like some just bad behaviour, really. And I realised I like was... What? Just not paying my debts, like diving from one wing <laughs> to up. another. Superman. Yeah, you know, all of that sort of behavior, man. And that's like, that's anyone who's done jail, they'll know exactly like where, where I've been. And it was just, I realized I was swapping one addiction for another one. But this one was, it's just so much worse. Unknown. People call it green crack, prison crack. Because once someone gets to smoking it, they want it every day, every day. And when you ain't got it, you get sweaty. You can you, know, you can detox from it. I've heard that. You rattle. Like, yeah, rattle from it. It's really really strange experience for something that was classed as a legal high. Yeah, yeah. I remember taking it the first time. Was it in Stoke Heath? And when, a, when someone said "Merry Christmas, bro," and I thought it was a roly. Yeah. I just had a couple of drags. I had to go and bang my, myself up because I just thought... I'm in trouble here. Yeah. And and I had that paranoid feeling. So all the bad effects of weed that yeah. I get is... is it's is intensified. Spice. It's intensified. intensified. Yeah, so I yeah. didn't like it like it. Like, do you know no. what I mean? But yeah, I never got to the point of of, of, um, uh, of getting addicted to it. But it was another time when I was rattling, doing a bad rattle off the meth as well. And I bought just a 25 stick off somewhere. Yeah. And... I remember just smoking spliff after spliff one night and I was just comatose. And during that time, I didn't think of the cluck. As no. mad as this sounds yeah. like, I wasn't clucking. It's just mad. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's mental. It's, it's a lot of people who say it ruined the prison system. It as, has. As, as it was. The drugs culture in it has gone. Yeah. Because it's nothing else. And even if you go outside on road now, spice isn't as prevalent as it was. No couple of years ago it's hard it's back to gear yeah mainly or fent they say fentanyl, fentanyl but it's yeah. gear and crack um xanax them things yeah. you know the spice i don't really see i see it but not as much but jail is still yeah it's fucked. it's listen it's the easiest drug to get into the gel right because it's like you know and they're getting it in chemical form now they're like they're making the spice paper within the gel they're not you know are they in yeah the gel? in gel yeah it's an orange orange chemical it's um uh, i've seen it many a times and they just they get the vape oil uh they mix it up and they put it on the paper and they let it dry out and they're making their own spice paper because you can't a lot of gels now you can't get paper sent in you can't get letters sent in because they photocopy all yeah, the mail yeah. because that's how bad the spice has got that they go into a photocopy in the mail and not giving you the the original uh, letter because just in case it's been laced. same with photos. Yeah, it? same with photos. Photos are even worse because they're thicker. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? So email they're... a prisoner now. Like now, yeah. everything is because of that, isn't it? Because of spice. Spice changed. Spice has changed the system. Like, like people say, COVID changed the system. Right, they're doing a lot more bang up. But, yeah, but you used to, like you know when you used to bring gear or subbies in letters and you put them in like the rule yeah, in, the, in yeah. the solicitor letters yeah. or you put them in the binders. Yeah. You can't even do that no more because no. they might think it might be spice. Yeah. You can't bring them in. Can't bring them in. It's just like even when you're getting recalled, if you're going back on a recall, now that used to be a way of getting drugs into that, the jail. That was a way of making money as well. Yeah. If someone would pay you yeah, to go back to jail. If you got like two or three months, six months, whatever, they go, right, why don't you go out? Get yourself a little 14-day recaller because that's all they give most people, 14 days or seven days, unless you're doing the IPP or EPP. Yeah, I wouldn't chance it. Yeah, I was no, like, IPP. No, no, I would, no, you're right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> See you in 10 years. Yeah. Uh, so, and a lot of guys uh, were handing themselves in, coming in with loads of paperwork, you know, yeah. sh reams of spice paper, and now that's all stopped. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's people like uh, in Cardiff, I know, who, who like, that was their job. Yeah. That's all they done. They, you know, and people knew who these people were. These are people who are willing to just come in. You pay them, you tell them yeah. where to go, they, and they bring it in, and they just have fourteen days roof over their head and just get in getting high. high, getting high for two, <laughs> getting high for two weeks. Solid. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, then yeah, the yeah. prison prison staff start to clock. Then you're yeah. you're coming in all the time. You yeah. always got things. Yeah, 
They know. Fuck off. So yeah. that's why they've come with like these full body scanners, scanners now, like they, yeah. the airport style scanners. Because yeah, you had the bosses, didn't you? The, yeah, the beat, boss yeah, one the and the beat the boss. Chair. Remember them? <laughs> Remember the boss chairs? The boss and they had to get the number two because yeah. the one was getting one. battered. Yeah, because they got the boss chair and everyone got beat the boss phones. Beat the so, boss, that was the phone, really. Yeah, beat the boss phone. Oh, okay, sweet, thank you very much. And But now, if we're going to talk about phones in jail quickly, it's not little Zankos anymore. What is it then? Smartphones. They all got smartphones. Are you talking through iPhones, officers? Yeah, through officers. Can't come. Listen, unless they're coming no, over the wall, yeah. there is no. You ain't other plugging way. a fucking. You are not plugging an iPhone. Especially on fourteen. And people are saying on a visit, but they got the scanners on the visits yeah, as well. Got the scanners on the visits. There's only one way these phones are coming into the jail. I've seen iPhone boxes in the prison. That's bin. mad. The, the, no. So they're bringing them in in boxes. Well, you do know you know what what's mean? mad to me? Like, yeah, because the thing that's sad really is, like, it's an I'm. I'm seeing more and more TikTok videos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. like, like people are like, it's blatant. Blatant. On the photo. And I'm like, how? Mm. How are these governors ain't locking this shit down? Yeah. I had a video. I sent this video to Sir Robert Butler, my MP. He used to be the former uh, prisons minister, right? I'm friends with him. You know, friends in high places and all that. But I sent him a video because it was so bad. It was a guy, a prisoner with a phone. And he's videoing this this prison officer this screw and the prison officer looks at him and goes why are you filming me you're gonna get me sacked and just banks like the way just banks like the way like so that. that officer was the one bringing the shit yeah in. obviously bringing it in or compliant well, at he, least well, compliant no, what he was doing there, what he was doing there the obviously that was ransom weren't it? Yeah. he was doing that to fucking say listen yeah, i got you, I got you. I got you. And he posted it online anyway, because it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, and that's the thing, you can't mate. trust the prisoner. I know. You can't trust oh, the no, prisoner. Oh, no, 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 no. Anything. They're, put, they're just like, they go, oh, yeah, you're right, boss, but secretly filming. Secretly filming them. And, like, and no governors are doing anything about it. The, the, the whole system is breaking with the amount of social media so, coming out of social, HMPs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's why TikTok changed their rules. Because you have to, to earn money from TikTok, you have to um, show who you are. You have to have either have a driving license, birth certificate, or, or passport. Some of you ain't got in prison. Some of you ain't you got know, in officers jail. are bringing in passports just yeah. so people can make TikTok accounts. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> it, it's nuts. I sat and watched someone on a TikTok live streaming from jail. They were all sat there, all of them on their own phones, just scrolling. And they were getting gifted so much, so much money coming in. And about like about two weeks later, TikTok changed the whole... Uh, obviously, they were aware of what Send was Send me happening. some money. I got no family sending me posts. That's, that's what was kind of... That's what they were saying. Oh, hard life in HMP, man's on lock down red you know giving yeah, it all yeah. the blah blah talk and yeah he's doing all right but they're not now what's the most surreal thing you've seen in prison then when it comes to that stuff was it was it probably the tiktok live is it yeah tiktok lives man or oh, i've seen someone make a music video <laughs> i've seen a music what, video. Un, what unlegit like. uh, unlegit yeah but they've made their own music video i've seen fewer because you know all these drill rappers they're all getting locked up at yeah. the moment they're all getting live sentences and they ain't stopping rapping just because they're in the big house they they they've now it's they've better. yeah now they're getting even more followers because you know they're busting out and it mad to think that life is it's more important to have followers than yep. actually have a life have a life yep. i said a statement the other day what, what do you think of this Back to drug users. Drug users, people who are homeless, who use drugs, are more in touch with reality than the normal people. Yeah, absolutely. Because they don't have phones. They don't have, they, they, they don't have they social media. They speak in real time. Yeah. Do you, would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. It's like, it's people like, would say, how are people on drugs more in reality? I'm telling you, like, people are actually in real human touch. Yeah. They, you know, they go out and, you know, they, they talk to another <laughs> human being. Like, I was like, I've got a phone and I've got all these different apps, but no one actually phones me. You like, you phoned me the other day. And I was like, what the hell's going on here? Someone's actually phoning my phone. Yeah. It, all it's Not now, messaging. And... It's a DM now, and it send me a send me a, a private message or or something like that. It's no yeah. one really talks anymore. That's why I love doing my my social media stuff. 
because I love coming out having a little chat every single yeah, day. Yeah, good. Makes makes me makes me worth it's, getting it's, up. It's yeah, it's it's important to 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 communicate like yeah. that. You know, I think in years time we are just going to be. Mm. We're going to make noises. That's noises. How, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's literally, we are being dumbed down so much as a society. You don't write. You don't write letters. Everything's in short, like the text, text talk. Batteries. Oh. Was it off Ali G? B8 res. <laughs> B8 <laughs> res. Yeah, batteries. The B8 res. <laughs> and that's the thing. And it's a genuine thing. People are becoming just less smart I, 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 I was saying really smart said less smart but do you know what I mean it's like people are literally going to a point now where you're not communicating you're not going out you're not going out to meet people anymore if you're not meeting on an app you're sexually harassing someone do you know what I mean wow that's, do you know what you've just made me realise that <laughs> that's deep <laughs> And that's true. what it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like everyone back in the day, you'd introduce yourself, you'd go meet someone. Yeah. You try and do that today. You mate, what are you doing? What are you come? Oh yeah, yeah. For? You ask, you ask. So, you know, back in the day, you ask your parents or you know family or old, just older generation. How did you meet? Oh, we met in a nightclub. Where yeah. did you meet? Oh, he bloody fucking pulled me in this pub and oh, we work together. What yeah. is it now? Tinder, Tinder, Grinder. Yeah, plenty of fish, <laughs> fab swingers. You know, you know them all, yeah. then. You know them all. <laughs> you know them all, then, ain't you? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, though, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's just all these apps, and yeah. and, and and you're weird if it, if it wasn't that. Yeah, it, it, that's, you know? that's exactly what it seems to be. And like, you got to think, a lot of people are coming out of the prison system, right? And they've got no clue about any of this stuff. I know. Like right? when I talk to ex cons about. TikTok and stuff like that and I'm trying to get them involved they're like nah man <laughs> feds are watching that shit fam I'm like dude it's an app you know what I mean it's just there's nothing we're not doing anything illegal it's just somewhere you can come <laughs> and chat <laughs> to me I'm not trying to sell you drugs yeah. do you know what I mean but they're like nah man it's not I'm not well on. that's good because they, they're quite aware in a way like because yeah. it, everything is being recorded these yeah, days everything you know, everything you know, like, like, like we, we walk around with our phones isn't it? we walk around with our phones and wherever I go my phone tells me exactly where I've been all week it tells me, oh, I carry it. but so I kind of keep that on because safety. It's a safety measure because from early doors when I was being accused of things, I'm like, right now, nah, that's it. I'm leaving my, I'm leaving my, <laughs> my tracker on. We've interviewed. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard any of these cases, but the Cardiff Five. Yeah, and and we've done like a few criminal injustice cases mm. where. They've been done for something they haven't done, and it's just like a nightmare. And it's a yeah. nightmare that mate. Yeah, you know, shit like that is. It's bad enough when you've done it. Yeah, you know, when you yeah. go to jail. Can you imagine doing something you haven't done? Dude, I just I was watching something the other day, and some guy in America just got out after doing like thirty years for a crime he didn't commit. You know, because DNA is what yeah. it is now. They best be like, paying him well, mate. Yeah, they well, best be paying him. You, you don't say. You can't they? even buy back time, can you? No, but no, there's no amount of money that's giving you about thirty years of yeah. jail time, is there? Really? Exactly. And thirty years of the thing is, when you go into a prison environment, you adopt that prison environment. It's just the way you live. You do it. I do it. We've lived that life, so you're always there's certain things we do. I don't really usually sit with the door right behind me like we've got it today you're not the first person to say that yeah um i've had a few people say that yeah it's it's a it's a weird thing well i'm glad you feel comfortable yeah 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 i'm glad you feel comfortable here yeah no it's been great mate yeah no nah. okay then so <laughs> so we've so the weapons man <laughs> making making shanks in jail what like how are you I don't want to say that actually, but um, what I'll say is, is how is it coming out of jail this time? What 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 have you done different? What 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 was different this time? Um, my partner gave me an ultimatum. You call it an ultimatum or whatever you want to call it. She sent me an email through the email of prisoner that made me understand in no uncertain terms that. If I didn't sort it out this time, I was about to lose everything that I'd been trying to get those 
nights when I was sleeping on the streets and I was thinking, oh, it'd be so nice to have a big old bed and a nice woman to lay next to and kids. And she basically said, mate, I ain't putting up with it no more. you got to think, every time I was coming out of jail, she'd sorted the flat out, made it all nice. And I'm like, well, I want to sell that TV for heroin. And I'm going to sell that microwave for a 20 bag. And that's what I would do. I would constantly do that. And I kind of knew she was putting up with it somewhere in the back of my brain. I knew I was getting away with it. And when she said, this is it, no more second chances, no more... Mrs. Nice Lady, I'm coming real. And if you don't sort your life out, you're going to lose everything. That, along with the fact that I did the maths and realised that I'd served over 20 years, that was... Yeah, that's, that, that's a long time. It's a it long time. It must have come to a, a, a crashing halt there, like where it's just like, listen, I've had enough. Because I yeah. think that is what happens to us. It's... We have expiry dates. And yeah, we if, do. if you still love taking drugs, you're going to keep taking drugs. Yeah. You know? um, what about like the? I don't want to sound like you know talk about the macabre, but how close have you been around death? Is it? Have you seen like friends I've, go? And, yeah, I've seen a lot of people OD, man. A lot of people who haven't come back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was uh, someone in my partner's family died the other day, and she was having a tear up, and I was like, oh, I'm so rubbish at this, babes. So I said, I'm so rubbish. I said, but you've got to understand. I've seen so many people's lights go out. Do you know what I mean? You sat there having a hit together and then they, they go. And I've seen that. I've seen guys hanging in cells. I've seen guys cutting themselves up. You become sort of desensitised to it. It's not a big thing seeing someone's lights go out. It is, but once you've seen it so many times and... I've seen guys dragged out of flats and stuff where people don't want the police or ambulance come into the flat. Do you know what I mean? It's real brutal sort of behaviour. And I've lived with that for three decades. I live with that sort of, that, that lifestyle. So, yeah, I've seen a lot of people come and go and a few people I really actually cared for. Like I had a really good friend in Bristol put me up when I had nowhere to stay. Like he, had, he, was, he was in a little bed set. Oh, put me up, do you know what I mean? Find me a little spot on his floor. And yeah, it's like, you know, he he, he OD'd on me. Like that was, a, that was a pretty tough one. But if you're in that lifestyle, if you're using drugs like I was, I was injecting, do you know what I mean? The chances are you're going to come across that. And, I'm one of the very fortunate people who was, I was an IV user. I used to do snowballs, all of that crap. And I'm still here. I can still hold down a half of a conversation. Oh, you're so, really, good at, really good communicator. So yeah, really I, do, I, do, I do talk a bit though, don't I? Yeah. yeah. Could you quickly describe to me, I know what it feels like, but a snowball for the public, because obviously curiosity kills a cat sometimes, but... Also, we'd like to explain to people what it's like. So a snowball, so we're breaking it down into English, is heroin and crack cocaine cooked up, put in a needle and taken at the same time. Heroin brings you down, makes you want to sleep. Cocaine obviously brings you up. So when you take a snowball, a mix of the two, it's like your body is on like that. You're going up, up, up so high, then all of a sudden... You're down and then you're like that for a minute. It's really, I don't, I can feel the feeling now just thinking about it. I was no, I never really liked it. It was just a quicker way of getting the drugs into my system. Do you know what I mean? Instead of all of that running it up and down, a foil all bloody like these posh, posh users. You know, it's, it was quick, simple, but it made you paranoid but makes you like gouchy at the same time. It's very strange, really strange experience to have. But you know, that like I said, it was just about getting getting the drugs into my system and going out and raising again. Because that was it. So it's important people know then, like yeah. the actions you've taken, the barriers you've come across since getting out of prison and making this change, because this is massive. And we know that the, the the success rate of people coming out of heroin addiction is shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's eight percent. 
So celebrate it. Tell me what you've done. We need to... Because I think there is, with awareness and inspiration, I think we could ourselves put these percentages higher. Yeah, I know, I know we can put them higher. I am putting them higher. Like I know through my live streams, I know the percentage of people that come in and tell me how much I'm helping them just by... <laughs> You know, I'm not some big guru or anything. I'm guru. just a guy who goes, right, I'm clean. This is how I got clean. And I want to bring you lot along with me. And that's what it's really about. Because, yes, my life was completely crap. And, yes, now I'm, I'm doing great. I'm not where I want to be. You know, I'm nowhere near where I want to be. I want to really be shouting from the rooftops. I would like... A recovery system like the one me and you live our life by now, yeah. to be mainstream. Yeah, that's my plan. It's a big plan. It's a big goal, but that's that's my plan. That's my dream. That's my hope. If that's what you want, then that's yeah. what you'll get. Yeah, you know, and um, I'm sure there's ways that we can help each other out in that. You know. Yeah. So, what kind of barriers are you seeing? Like I said, is there things that like? Yeah, it's like. Because I'm not operating as a peer mentor through one of the turning points or Change, Grow, Live, CGLs, one of the um, agencies, I'm very much on the outside. Mm. I'm on the outside looking in. I'm getting lots of applause from these places, yeah. but they're not going, Paul, why don't you come in and give a talk? Because that's what I do. I give talks. I give live So they talks. haven't offered you, have no, they? No, so no, no. I work for Kaleidoscope. So I work in services. Yeah. So CGL are massive. Like, I, you know, they're, they're, they're a service. Yeah. They're not all 12 steps over this. No, CGL, no, 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 yeah, no. So, so I work in services. I'm very blessed to be part of it. Central Club is a separate thing, and I feel is making noise, same as you're yeah. making noise. But I've got that there. You should be invited you should be celebrated and you should be given an opportunity by people like cgl thank there's you no excuses much. i don't think there's much excuse for it i i genuinely don't i don't see what the issue is you it, you're I mean? still on a methadone script yep. yeah yeah um how important is that to you because some people like i done a lad bible and when they said i'm on boover they were like he's still on drugs still on drugs mate mat it's called medically assisted treatment it's the same if someone has a tumor on their brain and they have chemotherapy it's there is no difference i have an illness and i needed medication for that illness to get better i'm now on that medication now i'm on a reduction plan i reduce myself quite regularly because yeah, don't do, don't push yourself no I, that's exactly the thing you that never feel problem off. is a lot of the drug agencies, when you say, oh, I want to come off a script, they're like, sweet. Yeah. Let's get you off of it tomorrow. And it's like, weird, that, isn't yeah. it? Because they quickly want to rise you as yeah. well. Are you still clucking? Should we put you up 10 mil? Yeah. You know, and they'll put you up to a dose you don't fucking need to yeah. be on. But when you say, yeah, you're right. There's yeah. no, like, There's no middle, middle ground. There's no, There's middle, no middle ground at all. There's no middle ground. So go on, yeah, you know, you feel like the methadone is... Yeah, so I'm, I'm, you know, the methadone's doing what it's supposed to. I don't get high, I don't feel buzz, I don't get a gouge, nothing like that. It's, if I don't have it in the morning, I, there's something, I just feel something's not quite yeah, right. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the addiction part, it's still the addict is always there going, I want more, I want more, I want more. But, um... Uh, my plan is to just keep reducing off of my scripts. I'm not in a big rush to, to get it done. I'm not embarrassed because I'm on medically assisted treatment. There's many ways to recover and there's many ways to detox. Some people like to go, I just detox, then I just got clean. And I'm like, well done for you. I'm really proud that you did that. Uh, you know, I'm buzzing for you. However, let me do it my way. Let you do it your way, and hopefully we'll all meet in the middle, yeah. clean, sober, and non-active yeah. in our addictions. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And some people they feel if they find the way, then that's the way. That yeah, that's they want the to only bring way. Other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah the that's only the only way. Yeah, exactly. And do you think what what do we need then to to to, to help other people? Do you think it's still doing the things we're doing, just like kind of making videos, yeah, letting people know this? Yeah, it's about opening up. It's about letting people actually understand that there is more than one way. 
And it's so important that people hear that there is more than one way to recover from addiction. You know, um, whether you're an alcoholic, whether you're a drug user, whether it's behavioural addictions, there's so many different ways to get to the same place. Um, there's so many roads, but we're all going in the, in the same direction. Yeah, and that's like what that. that's what it should be. You know, as long as you're going in that direction, as long as you're trying to better yourself, I don't see what the issue is. Yeah. I really don't. And I won't stop shouting. I won't stop live streaming. You know, I won't stop doing all of the things that I'm trying to do. Like I said, this BBC radio thing, that's a huge deal for me. You know, I'm a volunteer. It's, it's a very strange thing when they say volunteer because I don't see it. You know, I give these talks. I go to, like, community centre schools and stuff. I'm going down to Portsmouth uh, in a couple of weeks after the school holidays to do a talk down in a school in Pompey. And I don't class... i just trying to spread a message, trying to let people understand that you don't have to be... Just because you're comfortable doing something doesn't mean it's the right way. And I think that's really important people kind of understand that because... I was comfortable for so long in my addiction thinking, you know. I remember when I was on like 120 mil of methadone, right? Yeah. And using. <laughs> you know what I mean? And convincing. Sweating. Sweating buckets and convincing myself that, yeah, I'm doing all right. You're yeah. doing all right. Don't worry, you're just having a little blip. Do you know yeah, what I mean? And yeah. that's the crazy thing. As long as you are going in the right direction, I just don't see there being any problem whatsoever. I do genuinely think that, you know, we are breaking down barriers and stigma and looking at addiction in other ways. And yeah. I'm seeing more positive stories. I, yeah, I think they've always been there, but I think, yeah, I think there's more of a conversation happening now in Britain about drug use and yeah. oh, normalising it's, it's, it's definitely being normalised at the moment. It's, yeah. it's absolutely everywhere. Yeah. Or um, I'm even seeing adverts on TV mention addiction, mental health yeah. and stuff. That's never been. So right yeah. now, if we're not getting in the middle of it now, we're never going to get yeah, in the middle yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah, 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 exactly. This is, this is and the that's time. why I take my hat off to you for being like, you know, you said you're not getting help from these services, but you're still doing a talk down yeah. in the school in Portsmouth. You've got to take your fucking hat off, mate. Thank you. There's man. a lot of people in this world as well who use addiction in a nefarious way. Yeah. You know, there's people who are frauds in this game. Yeah, yeah, you know? fraudulently in recovery. Yeah. I know people. No, I, I, <laughs> fraudulently like in recovery. Fraudulent, fr no, yeah, I mean, and I mean it in the two ways, though. You've got the one way of they pretend they're clean. Yeah, and yeah. there's one pretending that they had a habit and they never had a habit. That's the one as I'm on about. But I know frauds mm. who are out there who say they had this problem, but they never did. Yeah. Yeah, because it's easy to jump on board. And they make it. a lot of money off off doing what they do. Yeah. When you when you come from a heart like from a place like us, yeah, and we're doing it for the right reasons to A, help in our recovery, yeah. B, help others and others. inspire. Yeah. We can take C. If we want to take something, you know, a, a fee, yeah. you know, to survive on, that's that's yeah, your that's, career yeah. now. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. But when there's people who are just doing it for C, just for a career, yeah, just for and a, career. a and B ain't even fucking true, they made up. Yeah. That's, that's naughty. Not, that's naughty. That's naughty. You know, yeah. so you're on the right track, mate. Thank well, you. I'm 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 still in, I'm still like on my journey in my career as well. But if there's anything I can help uh with, I would love to fucking help you, mate. You know, there's contacts and stuff and you know, get I know you live in Swindon, but you're same Bristol, it, mate. You know, it's, yeah. it's a stone throw yeah, away, it's mate. It's an hour away, man. Love you to come and see what we do in services in Wales. I will definitely, I will definitely, uh, I'll be back. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely. Because there's definitely, you've got it going on up here, mate, honestly. And in Swindon, I am a, just a little fish in this bowl going, ah, anyone hear me? Yeah. Even though I've done the newspapers, even though I've been on the way, all of that stuff I've been on the yeah, news. Yeah. I've been on the news for doing what I do. And not one person from Swindon Sorry, has gone, mate, we can use you. We can use what you're Well, we doing. know there's a problem in Swindon. Yeah. So Bad that's really sad. And maybe the people of fucking Swindon need to hear this. But you've got someone there who is willing to put his time and effort in. And I know there's a lot of people out there who will listen to you and help and take the advice. Oh, you're a good... 
You're you know, a good egg, man, honestly. You know, you you come to Cardiff now. What did you feel it was like walking around the city? You feel like there's a buzz here. Though. Yeah, I like it. It's really it's more metropolitan than than I than you thought. thought. You actually, thought it was more yeah. cheap, and you know, maybe that's because we went to Starbucks. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was fucking hills and sheep. Yeah. <laughs> That's where he lives. <laughs> no, hey, listen, like there's a big problem here of drugs, and mm. but I think we, we we're doing well in services. I think, and we, and we're trying to make it lived experience. Yeah, lived experience matters. And yeah, it really does. Trust more and give yeah. more responsibility because I think. A drug addict, right? People think that we rob left, right, and centre. Yeah. But you know, if I said, "Listen, can you do me a favour? Can you hold that on for me?" We like to prove people yeah. that we we're not junkies as yeah. well. At the same time, yeah. we can be trusted with things. Very much so. You know, like I'll give you an example quickly. I was six months clean. I got into my job. I was working in Newport, and I was giving drug tests, uh, giving uh, urine samples, taking obs. I was carrying methadone bottles wow. and boxes of Subutex yeah. upstairs to the lockup. They were trusting me with it. Yeah, because you can be, because we try double hard, because we've let so many people exactly. down. Exactly. It's just like, well, I'm definitely going to prove, yeah. prove to you. Like, that's like if someone lends me money, I'm like, as soon as I've got that money, 6 a.m. in the morning, I'm like, send me your bank details. I just want to do it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no it's right. You fucking no, can't. No. No, 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 it's right. Just let me, let, please. Then, then I've you know. been, I've done it. I've, I've, I've wronged people so many times. I need to make sure it's there for you because I've been looked at as a cunt. Excuse my French. <laughs> um, what we do with all our guests before we, we go, well, first of all, is it anything you want to, you want to say to the people maybe about your social media and stuff yeah and um just check me out on all social media platforms my name is paul addict mentor or paul simmons you can find me under either i live stream every single morning on tiktok it's an hour long live where i will give information advice and guidance across the board but yeah just check my social socials out and give me a follow yeah top man um and then what we do is um it might put you on a spot a little bit, but we like to, if you could look down that camera again and leave us with a positive message to someone who might be going through addiction, contemplating on coming through the other side, or just someone who's down on their luck. Right. I want to say this to you. Life isn't easy. Life is extremely difficult sometimes. And if you're suffering from addiction and you're in that dark spot, look at me look where i am just four years down the road we do recover to live our very best life you just have to put hard work and have confidence in yourself because i got confidence in you and i don't even know you mate honestly that was beautiful thank you honestly thank you so much um did you enjoy it? I loved it, man. I love these experiences, honestly. This was because this is, I didn't have time to panic. All the other ones I've done before, it's usually like a week's notice. And I'm like, well, uh, two days before, I'm like, I don't want to do it. I, I, I've given up. Yeah. And like, a lot of my followers will attest to that. That is my number one. I don't think, well, I don't know why they've asked me to come on. I'm no one. Do you know what I mean? So I've really enjoyed this. And it's good talking to someone in recovery, not someone who's just trying to dig some, you know, grotty prison stories. Like, it's been uh, nice. I'm glad. I'm glad you, you 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 think that. Because that's what I was aiming for. Yeah. That's what I was hoping for. And that's what I see sometimes. Yeah. Not naming names or nothing. No. I just yeah, I feel like sometimes people are just there for the shock factor. Yeah, you know, prison reform and stuff, people are interested in it, but sometimes it's for the wrong reason. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to have spent my three-year anniversary with no one else, and I genuinely mean that. Thank you so much. It's been a really, really... Uh, it's been funny. It's It's been sad. But it's definitely been inspirational. Um, really inspirational. Um, again, Paul, thank you so much. Guys, if you enjoyed this episode, please, please give us a follow. Hit that like button. Leave a comment. What do you think? What do you think about Paul? Have anyone got any help for him? Anyone out there who can offer him anything in the area of Swindon or anywhere else? But let us know. If you enjoyed this one, we're sure we can get him on for a part two. 
me and my fourth year anniversary definitely. maybe definitely you know we definitely. could uh, like turn that. it into a, our but, little anniversary yeah little anniversary <laughs> <laughs> yeah no again thank you so much Paul till next time guys stay central <laughs> The Central Club.